Ooh, baby, hit me harder. I don't have cat and nine tails on the back, on the end of this though. Damn it. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another wonderful episode of the Black Dahlia Twins podcast. Woo! I'm Quinn. I'm Shelby. And I got a foxtail. It's so soft. That's nice. Ooh, she's touching my foxtail. So today's topic is about mummification and embalming. Where and when it started, why it started, and the evolution of the process. So to start off, what is the difference between mummification and embalming? So the difference between mummification and embalming is that embalming is a temporary form of preserving a body. So once you die, you know, you might have some family that lives out of state or out of the country, depending on who you are. So a lot of times it might take family a day or two to be able to actually make time to go to your funeral. So it slows down the decomposition. Correct. Okay. Yes. Mummification, on the other hand, is something that's a little more permanent. It's more of a dehydration of the body that will preserve your body for the long term if in the environment stays correct. Obviously, if you take a mummy from Egypt and you put it in a very humid and moist environment, it will start to decompose. So they basically just turn us into human jerky. Precisely. Awesome. Woo. <laughs> I went to the body exhibit one time. They I've had been there twice. They had a, a person where they completely split all of their muscles apart, and it was like you could pick jerky <laughs> right off of them. Just. Actually, but delicious. what they do to preserve those bodies is basically they submerge their bodies in a chemical that turns their muscles and tissues into a form of plastic. Mm -hmm. So you probably wouldn't want to eat it. No, I did touch it. It did feel like plastic. You're not supposed to touch the bodies. Oops. Now, when we talk about the history, um, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think, um, like, mummification? Ancient Egyptians. Correct. Yeah, and I did look it up. That actually is the very earliest time that we can record that people started doing things to our body to preserve them. And they had like a really interesting way of going about it. They didn't do it just like for fun. They didn't do it because they wanted to visit the bodies later and it would still look the same, um, kind of like how we kind of do it now. They did it to actually preserve the body for transcendence into the next world when they die. Because they didn't, didn't they believe that as long as your body was still intact and still in one piece that you still had a body in the afterlife? Correct. Okay. Yep, along with burying all their gold with them <clears throat> and everything like that. Uh, they believed in the next life and they tried to make everything pristine. So they started coming up with these uh, processes in order to make the body whole. Did you know they actually did use to mummify the actual, um, like, pets and oh, yeah, I knew things they... in ancient Egypt so that they can bring their pets with them? So we don't actually know when mummification was really started. We can only assume when they started mummification. Um, it seems like it'd be kind of like a long process of figuring out what works, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, they were very smart back then uh, as far as, like, their own form of technology so and birth control yeah which is birth interesting control. might um, might maybe be another subject we might elaborate on in a later episode but i'm not 100 percent sure but the earliest times that i could come up with was back in the first dynasty of 32,000 bc ancient priests were in charge of uh, mummification and the embalming process so they did so by removing the organs drying the body out and covering the body with some sort of natron and we'll talk a little bit more about that process later now that's the earliest time that i can come up with that they started the process now it got a little more professional this is when they started doing it like as a profession was back in 2600 bc uh, during the fifth dynasties of egypt and then they continued that same process for two thousand years into Roman times. It actually, the process of it hasn't really changed a lot um, until recent years of embalming. 
Now on that subject, since there's not much history to find on the ancient Egypt as far as when, where, we do exactly how because we don't know the true elements or all the ingredients that went into being able to dry out and dehydrate these bodies. So it's funny how the mummification and the embalming process really started is that we're always, as human beings, trying to beat death. We are trying to find some sort of way of prolonging life, even after we know it's gone, for either the spirit to help move on or to help loved ones uh, move on as well so that they're not seeing their decayed family member before they put them in the earth. So how did they mummify the bodies like that we know of? Usually the first step would be removal of the brain. But in some instances, like King Tut, they actually didn't remove King Tut's brain. So not in every mummy instance do they actually stick a rod through your nose and scramble your brain and pull it out with a hook. A hot rod. <laughs> but the skull, if they did remove the brain, was then repacked with. What is it? It just seems like a lot of work for brain, so I could see why they just left it one day. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Step two was evisceration. Um, the internal organs were removed through the abdominal abscission. The organs were either washed and mixed with resins and spices and returned to the body or placed in separate burial jars. You know, there was five jars, which I believe... Ooh, like, the, like from the mummy and those guys took the jars and then he, they got... Four the jars, of... excuse me. There was four yeah. jars. The mummy had that extra jar, which actually didn't make any sense. That actually, there's, there's four jars. There's four organ jars called canopic jars. That's where they're called. Canopic jars. Step three was the immersion. The body was immersed in natron, which is a sodium salt, which I had explained earlier. They had it, mm -hmm. it was mixed with the salt and a couple other things. A couple other a, things. A couple other things. <laughs> um, the caustic action, basically very acidic, very dry. Um, the solution would cause the fingernails and the toenails to basically fall off and be removed. Be, um, they were also replaced in keeping with the belief that the body must be intact. 3,000 years later, the immersion lasted for roughly 20, 70 days, depending on how fast or how well that solution worked. Um, step four was, you know, the body would dehydrate. The body was cleansed, straightened, and allowed to dehydrate in the sun. And a lot of times they would still position the body while it was being immersed in that sodium solution. After that, after I got some time to sit out in the sun and get a nice tan, because you know, we all love getting tans. Well, not me. An afterlife tan is the best. Mm. Beautiful sun-kissed glow. <laughs> Um, they would wrap the body, so about 1,200 yards of bandage that was about three and a quarter inches thick was used to wrap the body. A type of gum, which is also a type of glue, held the cloth together and helped it to fit around the body while it was still damp. The body was then placed in a sarcophagus and returned to the family. And if they were royalty, put into a tomb and or pyramid. Now, I would assume, I mean, besides some, like, say, priests, priestesses, you know, some of the lower, but still high up people, I, I would assume that unless you basically live in the royal palace, you wouldn't have the money or the means, means to do the mummification process. So it seemed like all of the mummies that have been found lately or ever we will ever find are probably most likely royalty in some sort of aspect or another or higher up because a lot of the other bodies that they found in ancient egypt were you know slaves or just normal mm -hmm. average people mm -hmm. like of, most people like you and me a lot of bones if they were preserved they were in any, if they were preserved in any way that was just nature's accidental preservation of their bodies 
which is funny because that's also kind of another way that I guess you can embalm the bodies is nature. Nature is a very interesting thing. And I'm glad you brought up nature preservation because our next subject is bog bodies. Ooh, I'm into bog bodies. Actually, what's a bog body? So a bog body, some of you guys may have heard of them. Most of them are those like dark skinned mummies that have the almost as red of hair as I have right now. Um, they're also known as like one of the best preserved bodies were all found in raised bogs, which form in basins where poor drainage leaves the ground waterlogged and slows plant decay. We all know that lack of oxygen mm-hmm. and lack of bacteria help with the mum- preserving and or mummification of a body. Over thousands of years, the layers of um, a type of moss, which is called spascum moss, accumulate, eventually forming a dome fed entirely by rainwater. So a raised bog contains few minerals, very little oxygen, and lots of acid. We all love acid. Not to like eat your flesh kind, obviously, right? Cause... No, it's, it's, it's acidic soil, basically. Add in low northern European um, temperatures, and you have a wonderful refrigerator for conserving dead humans. I love nature. Remember, guys, Mother Nature. Mother Nature can give us everything if we just know how to use her. Don't use Mother Nature. Be one with Mother Nature. Words of wisdom, my friend. So a body place here... Um, decomposes extremely slowly. Mm-hmm. Soon after burial, the acid starts tanning the body skin, hair, nails, which is why I brought out the skin looks black in appearance and the hair seems very red. But also, a lot of these bogs were in like Scandinavia, Norway, mm-hmm. Germany, um, Ireland. Lots of Ireland um, area where these bogs are found with these... Some of the most famous bog That's bodies are all crazy. found in this one little European area. Yeah. And now what happened? Yeah. Yeah. Um, What's my fortune? <laughs> so, the mo- so after a while, the moss starts to die. It releases a carbohydrate polymer called um, sphascum. Um, it binds nitrogen halting the growth of bacteria and further mummifying the corpse. Oh, so it wasn't even done yet. No. The the spaskin also extracts calcium leached out of the body's bones. Mm. This helps to explain why after a thousand or so years the treatment of a corpse ends up looking like a squished rubber doll. Why they all kind of appear flat and wrinkled, and you can tell they're a human, but you're just like, I can't really 100% tell because it looks like a deflated balloon. Monster! Monster! <laughs> but nobody can say for sure whether the people who buried the bodies in these bogs knew that the moss would keep those bodies intact. So they don't know whether they buried them in these bogs on purpose. Or whether nature just did this and they had no idea. It could have been a complete accident. So. I think that's actually really funny and interesting because, you know, back in ancient times, like where, you know, Egyptians and things like that, we Mm -hmm. can't even fathom how they did certain things, Mm -mm. right? I think it's because we had a knowledge of the world that we don't have today. Mm Mm-hmm. Kind of like the theory behind if back in the old, you know, where you only could take a train to go places or a carriage, um, time could have split somewhere and there could be another dimension where we went steam powered, like steampunk, Mm -hmm. or went steam powered instead of electric. Now, same goes for old times. They They didn't have what we have, electric. They didn't have, you know, they might have, they might have actually had technology like steam or 
things like something like that to where it can't be detected now because it's so natural. But they knew how to harness it and use Mother Nature for whatever they needed. I think we need to go back to that. But on top of the bog bodies and them not really knowing whether they were doing it on purpose or on accident, they could. Oh, it's highly unlikely that they 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 would wouldn't know. But still, it's tempting to think that they did, since if it's so perfectly with the ritualistic functions of bog bodies. That's why I think they did know, because back then, back in the day, Regard- we knew a lot more about Mother Nature and what she has to give us than we do now. We are we are blindsided because of the technology that we have nowadays. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we touched up on mummification. Natural mummification. Natural mummification using, again, using Mother Nature to help preserve our bodies. Uh, second one, using strictly Mother Nature, where she does all the work. The next one I wanted to talk about is self mummification. Before you're dead. But before you're dead. Before you're dead. You can't self-mummify yourself after you're dead. (laughs) Touche. But how they would do that is Buddhist monks, in order for them to transcend, they believed that they, just like the Egyptians, had to preserve their body for the afterlife. So the self-mummification process was called Soko Shinbatsu. And... They would end up... Say that ten times fast. Yeah. Soko Shinbasu. Soko Shinbasu. Soko Shinbasu. Soko Shinbasu. Nope. They spent 3,000 days. Now, count that up real quick. In year time. Well, 365. Over nine years. I was, I was, I was going to say, isn't that like eight, nine years? It's almost a decade. Yes. Yes. It takes anywhere from 8 to 10 years. Of basically torturing yourself. Because you basically starve yourself to death. You're only allowed a certain... You have to replace your normal diet with that of items that speed up the mummification process from the inside out. And what exactly does that consist of so they would go on a strict diet called moko jiki oko literally meaning eating a tree so they would eat tree bark as well as pine needles seeds nuts resin and literally anything that they could just find in the woods on the ground but could you? Oh, and stones. Did I mention stones? No. Yeah. Try passing those in your stool. Try passing any of that in your stool. Actually, I'd rather pass a stone than tree bark. <laughs> so by the end of this, when they basically have starved themselves to death, they would continue on this regimen of physical activity. This controlled system would basically strip the uh, body fat from their muscle. So it, again, made the mummification process a lot easier. If you don't have that body fat in there, then your body can just dry up a lot easier, it seems like. Makes sense. And not only that, they would also drink poisonous tea. (laughs) I just call this self-torture, not self-mummification. I like food way too much. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know. You're telling me you can't live off nuts? And tree bark? Nuts, maybe. Not tree bark, though. <laughs> but I mean, you know, as they say, the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Same goes for us women. So we eat his stomach. Oh, sorry. I went somewhere else on that. No, we eat his heart. <sighs> we all, y'all, you know that we have to eat their heart. We eventually eat it anyways. Buy us tacos first, though. <laughs> and not the fake-ass tacos. Give us some actual carne asada tacos. Because tacos are life. This woman knows her tacos. Don't. I like tacos. Don't 
mess with her. So the poisonous tea would cause vomiting to again get out any liquids left inside of the of the monks. They were trying to literally take all the liquid that's inside of them and just purge it. Well, have you ever been dehydrated before? Or hung over at least. <sighs> I've been dehydrated that, before. That it's headache, not fun. It's not fun. That headache? I could only imagine what they were that just sounds excruciating and painful and uncomfortable. Again, though, you, like you said, they're monks. Uh, they have, like, really high, like, they could probably handle it. Uh, like, mental, like, goose I would, I would just, no, I'm sorry, just. <laughs> <laughs> Kill myself samurai style, man. I don't care. <laughs> I have dishonored my family! <laughs> the poisonous tea would also kill the maggots um, so that you would not be eaten by them after death. So basically it was a bug repellent. Bug repellent too. Yeah, they thought, they thought ahead. And the final act is where they put themselves inside of a tomb in the lotus position and bury themselves alive. Didn't, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they also like have a bell that way, that they would ring periodically to signal that they were still alive and then once they stopped ringing the bell, all the other monks knew that they were dead? You are right. You are right. That is actually where it came from. Like, yeah, because yeah, like obviously in Victorian times and earlier they would have a bell because obviously there were a lot of accidental live burials because their methods of finding out if a body was or a person was actually dead weren't very accurate. And the body is an amazing thing. Like sometimes we don't know the weird things that happen to us that make us look like we're dead. Every aspect. And then all of a sudden... <gasps> well they've also discovered they dug up some of those old bodies and have found claw marks, scratches on the inside of the the coffins. But also, they feel that some people, like if they were in a coma, obviously your heart rate is slowed and your breathing is slowed. So a lot of times it was hard to detect whether or not you're breathing or whether or not your heart was still beating. But a lot of times they think that a lot of there was probably more accidental live burials because most people didn't wake up and they just died from asphyxiation. Hmm. You know, and I that's where I thought that's the reason why it came to that was because of the claw marks. But yeah, it's all, all origin originated all the way back to cell phone vacation to the monks. Interesting. Yeah, so he would ring the bell each day to signify that he is still alive. And I guess once the bell stopped ringing, then I guess you can check on your cooked mummy. <laughs> it's done! So basically the tomb would have a little air tube so the monk can still get air while he's meditating trying to basically die. Yeah. He would ring the bell periodically every day. I'm sure it would be kind of hard to detect whether it was day or night unless we actually had some form of light coming through, which I highly doubt it. So True. I'm sure they just rang the bell periodically would be my best assumption. And then once it just stopped ringing, they'd be like, well, I haven't heard the bell for like three days. Pull out the air tube and seal it up and, and here's your mummy. And then he's transcended at that point, I guess. Yeah, I think that's the most gruesome mummification I've ever heard of. Everyone thinks the scrambling your brain and pulling it out through your nostrils is bad. Try having that done to you while you're alive. I mean, not that, but you know what I mean? Like the whole... I, I after I die, I don't care whether I go to a body farm. My body gets donated to science, natural burial, cremation. I don't give a rat's bahooty bubkiss. <laughs> what happens to me? Whatever my family wants to do, that's what they can do. I highly doubt I'm going to have kids, so there you go. But before you're dead. Did you go through anything like that? Mm, you can kiss my butt. No. 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 Would you do it now? Would you do it now? 
No. I get very cranky when I'm hungry. No. Now, if I can, I will try and put photos with this to show. So yeah, if I can put pictures, I will. Oh my god, look at the pictures! They put, they put sunglasses on him! Because the eyes are probably all caved in, that's probably why. These bodies were actually very well preserved, surprisingly. Only if it worked. And that's another thing. This process actually seldom worked. Oh god. So eight to ten years of doing this to yourself before death and basically committing suicide. And most of the time, your body wasn't actually preserved. So no transcendence for you guys. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, but also I'm a firm believer that if you died believing in something so hard, you probably transcended anyways, so I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> Thinking of the glass half full. Mind over matter. It's a thing. So besides the ancient Egyptians and the crazy monks, um, there has been a whole bunch of different cultures throughout the world that have done their own process of mummification. Uh, not as cool, not as interesting, but like the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Syrians would actually preserve them, they preserve their dead by placing them in jars of honey and wax. I'm sorry, how did you find a jar that big to fit a human in? I want, I want that jar. They probably made them. Uh, oh yeah, 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 clay like jars, clay, clay jars. jars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they probably did that. Um, it basically suffocated everything, like you were saying earlier. Well, honey, lack it, of oxygen. Yeah, lack of oxygen helps slow down the decaying process, but also honey, they found honey from ancient Egypt that is, they say is, you could still eat because such a high sugar content prevents bacteria from growing. Mm, okay, and that would help the bodies as well. Yep, no bacteria, no oxygen, mm -hmm. makes it a little hard to decay. Same with those bug bodies, there was a lack of oxygen and it was very acidic. It's kind of hard for bacteria yeah. to live in an acidic environment and also no oxygen because all organisms need oxygen. Well, not all organisms, most all organisms need oxygen. I just think it's funny that like, you know, even though from it's like all around the world, we all come up with the same kind of similar ideas based off of mother nature, what mother nature gives us like, oh, well, this helps with this, this helps with that. Why wouldn't it help with mummifying our bodies? <laughs> Do you know they have a modern day form of mummification? Hmm. So most mummification, they dehydrated the body. They took out all the moisture, therefore organisms couldn't survive. Mm -hmm. This modern day form, which I believe is in Europe, somewhere, and for about 4,000 British pounds, you can get your cat or your dog pet peacock, finch, rat, mummified. So that's like different than like taxidermy where they kind of like look. Yeah, no, no, no. This is, instead of them dehydrating the body, they actually hydrate the body in a certain solution. And then they remove all the organs, cleanse it like they would normal mummification back in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. And then they'll wrap the body in a gauze and cotton and then wrap it in a fiberglass and then put it in a steel sarcophagi. And then... Here's Fluffy! Fluffy! And you can and hold him and he's like... Mm. Wait, is he all hard? Well, it's a steel sarcophagi, so of course. But they say though that several years later you could open that up and your lovely, lovely animal will still look just as it did the day it died. Hmm. It's even a better preservation than mummification, so this company says. And in order to preserve your body, though, you're looking at about 40 grand. Yeah, because it takes a lot of extra, what, fiberglass stuff that they put inside of them? Well, f oh, they wrap the body in fiberglass oh. to probably help with lack of oxygen or uh -huh. the leaking of whatever liquid they preserve you in. The only problem though with humans is 
they tested it on a couple of people. After about 18 months, they cracked open the little sarcophagi to check on the bodies to see how well the process was going. But because of laws, they actually have to incinerate the body afterwards. They can't just steal it back up. It goes against mm. state laws or That's country weird. laws. So, you know, 18 months, this person's mummified. Well, it looks like it's going great. But unfortunately, now we have to incinerate the body because we cracked it open to check on it. Great. But hey, for about 40 grand, guys, you can be a mummy. I'd love to be a mummy. When I'm rich, guys. When I'm rich. Too bad I can't be on display, though. Literally do whatever you want with my body. I don't <laughs> care. Natural burial, I'm fine with. Just put me in a wicker coffin and bury me three and a half feet down. That way I'm deep enough to where animals won't bury me, but still not too deep to where bacteria and bugs and stuff can't get to my body. Mm. Let me return to the earth where yeah. I'm from because yeah. everything's got to eat. I might be a tree tree would be cool I'd like to be a tree I want people to carve into me too because it's like I have tattoos then <laughs> I'd put like a little sign it says please carve me <laughs> carve your name into my trunk <laughs> that has a whole new meaning to a guy now that we're off the subject of mummification Modern day mummification now. Let's talk about, you know, modern day embalming and how that works. I'm sure most of you watching have been to a funeral and or a wake. And I've seen a, a body in a, a casket. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Embalming really got its start back in one of the first wars when soldiers obviously died on the battlefield. Wait. They needed time to get back to their family. Right? Mm-hmm. So, most undertakers would take these bodies and pump them full of, I believe, was arsenic. They used arsenic for everything, don't they? They used arsenic for a lot of stuff. And obviously, arsenic is not a very good chemical, guys. But embalming really became big in the United States around, I want to say, Civil War era. It could be wrong. It could be World War One. I'm not 100% sure. So, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Thomas Holmes, who lived between circa 1817 to about 1900, is he's generally considered the father, fa the father, father, the father, Baja. the father of embalming or of modern embalming. He experimented with preservative chemicals while working as a coroner's assistant in New York, and later offered his services to the public. Hmm. Um. In the modern procedures of embalming, the blood is drained from one of the main veins, which usually they go into the collarbone mm -hmm. or into the thigh. Hmm. They get one of the main arteries and main veins. They hook up a tube into the main artery that would be full of the embalming fluid, which is roughly based on a, a formalin, which is a mix of formaldehyde and water. It's injected into one of the main arteries, and as they pump that in, all it goes through your circulatory system and out that vein, which would be all the old blood, all that. And I'm sure not a lot of you have watched Modern Day Embalming or have been in a coroner's office or anything like that. The formalin is actually dyed pink or red. Because if you think about it, when you die, you don't have the nice pink, fleshy tone to your skin. It's a little gray. It's a little blue, maybe a little green. Yeah, that's the blood that keeps your uh, skin looking so warm, right? Precisely. So a lot of times that formalin has dye in it. So then when it's going through the circulatory system, that gray washes out and kind of adds a little bit of color and liveliness to the skin. They also, if you've ever heard of jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin, they would wash the body 
in like a chemical solution and then literally take a rag and they're able to just wipe the yellow off of the skin if the body goes jaundice after death. Talk about a skin peel. Mm. It's very relaxing. Mm, I'm sure for the dead. Mm. Wait, who, who, the dead body or the, the guy doing it? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> but also before though they could pump this body full of formaldehyde, they would... Most of the time the bodies come in and they're still in rigor because rigor's a bitch. And they would slowly move the joints and sometimes there would be cracking and popping and sometimes still electrical impulses and the body would jump or move. Yes, precisely. <laughs> but they would the body massage, fights back. <laughs> they would massage and work the joints to be able to get the body into the position that they want, which is usually like this in a casket. Before they could pump the body full of their formalin because the formalin would stiffen the body because it's a preservative to temporarily preserve the body. So it does wear off. And yeah, oh, you're, you're still going to decay, guys. Yeah. Embalming does not preserve your body like a mummy. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You're going to still be six feet down in a casket mm -hmm. or coffin, depending on what you want. Mm-hmm. And you're still gonna decay, it's just gonna happen a lot slower. Sorry guys, but you're still gonna turn into maggot food. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the worms play pinochle on your snout. They eat your eyes, they eat your nose, they eat the jelly between your toes. So after they would drain your body with the, f the formula and they drain out all the blood and pump in that preservative they would then take your body cavity and stick this tube called a troker stick it in there they would suck up all the fluid that may have accumulated in your abdomen yeah sexy right we got a lot of liquid inside of us guys well especially after you decay a lot of things just tend to leak mm -hmm. suck up all that liquid and then pump that body cavity full of more of that formalin, which was also mixed with alcohols, emulsifiers, and other substances like embalming fluid, the formalin, to keep the body temporarily from shriveling up and turning brown. Because I don't know if you've ever seen blood after it's dried up and oxidized, because what does iron do when it oxidizes? It rusts and it turns orangey brown. That's what your blood does. Mm -hmm. But of course, earth material embalming is not permanent, like I have said before. Because even such carefully prepared corpses like Lenin, who's on display in the Kremlin, still has to get regular periodic renewal treatment. Meaning they drain out all that old embalming fluid and pump him with new embalming fluid. So how long does that last before they have to redo that process again? I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure with, I'm in wondering. Lennon's case, he's probably in a refrigerated display mm -hmm. where it's humidity controlled. And I'm sure, I guess, a periodic renewal process. So I'm sure maybe once a year, maybe once every couple of years, he might have to have that embalming fluid renewed. So the chief purpose of embalming is really to give the body a lifelike appearance, right? Mm -hmm. Well, during the days in which it is being viewed by mourners, it's to also help with it, make, giving it a lifelike appearance, they would use masking paste and cosmetics, makeup. They'd also use modern day morticians, use like these little plastic curved things to put behind your lips so it doesn't look like your teeth are caved in or they stick little half domes underneath your eyelids because your eyes tend to sink in after a while. They also take some, not all morticians, but some of them literally take something that looks like a little screw in, screw it up your butt. A little butt plug. A literal butt plug because seepage. Other times they'll just put a giant depends on you. It all depends on the mortician. It all depends. It all depends on the mortician because sometimes 
they're just not comfortable doing that and it's out of respect out of the body because I mean mm. even though you're dead it's still a human body mm-hmm gotta be respectable like it's like what were you telling me about the whole washing the body again oh they still lay a cloth over your intimate areas to help maintain modesty so guys don't worry about you laying completely stark naked on a cold metal table while a complete stranger is rubbing you down basically because you're still going to be somewhat covered up like they maintain your modesty like they maintain your integrity because they know that no you might not have any use for your body but it's still a respect thing Mm-hmm. So I can see that. I can see that. Respect. Don't don't ever do that again. <laughs> Here in the great U.S. of S, embalming is the standard practice as a result of the government support, and it has received only mandatory when bodies are being transported by common carriers, i.e., plane, car, oh. train. So if you want to. If you want your body to go anywhere, like to a specific place, and you and you he, have to be embalmed. So at that it doesn't point. matter what you what you want. It's either get buried where you die or get embalmed. Mm-hmm. And in many states, usually when there is an interval of more than forty eight hours between death and burial, mm-hmm. is usually when that's made. But guys, don't let a funeral home tell you that embalming is mandatory. It's not, if you don't want to be embalmed, you don't have to be embalmed. But if your body is going to be transported from, let's say, west coast to east coast or the Midwest to the south, you're probably going to have to be embalmed. But really, guys, though, don't ever let a funeral home talk you or convince you that you have to be embalmed, especially if it's something you don't want to do. If it's something you don't want, exactly. They want money. They get a lot of money from it. But guys, you don't have to be embalmed if you don't want to. It just means you can't have a wake, which is fine with me. I don't care. Some people want money, but I think some other people are just like, hey, let me play with your body. <laughs> Poke it with a stick. I just want to pop that little thing up. But even though it might be mandatory here in Europe, however, embalming is rarely practiced. In most, it is performed only by medical practitioners hmm. and the costs are pretty freaking high because they have a medical professional doing it mm-hmm. not somebody that just likes to play with bodies yep no offense i know you wanted to become a mortician i did <laughs> but now i'm gonna go for anthropology and said still get to play with dead bodies mm. um but when buried six feet down and without a coffin mm-hmm. in ordinary soil mm-hmm. an unembalmed adult Normally takes 8 to 12 years to fully become a skeleton. That's a long time. And however embalmed and placed in a coffin, the body can take many years to start to even decay and rot. That's crazy. So I could like dig up my grandma in like 10 years time and she'd still like... She'd be pretty green, oh, and there might yeah. be some fluid that she's floating in, depending on how sealed the coffin was. But she still would look pretty casket. much intact. Not grandma anymore, but intact. Yeah, I mean, it could take many years longer, depending on the type of wood that is used. Uh, Granted, though, do you know the difference between a coffin and a casket? I do, because you told me off camera, but how about you tell the ladies and gentlemen out there? So, the difference between a coffin and a casket. A coffin is usually made out of wood, Mm -hmm. is Mm six-sided, usually in the shape of a body. Mm -hmm. Caskets are rectangular and a lot more sturdy and sometimes not always made out of wood. Fun fact, just a personal fact, but my grandfather... I, f- I found this to be like the most morbid thing I've ever heard. He made his and my grandmother's casket. Casket or casket. coffin? Casket. Yeah, yeah, I, I was, whew. It's my, my grandfather, he's a carpenter. And 
he made, oh my gosh, I was expecting a coffin, right? Right? Like, ooh, ooh, you made it yourself, a coffin. No, imagine a really nice casket, like with the little metal bars to lift up the thing. And it had like nice little cushion inside with like silk lining. <sighs> my grandfather and my grandma are gonna go out in style. Well, my grandma already did. My grandfather, he has his in the garage. Isn't that funny? Like the last years, you know, the ending years of your life and you're like, you know what? It's about time, I'm gonna make myself a casket. Hey, thought, I, thought ahead, he'll be buried with my grandma right next to her in like matching caskets. It'll be cute. It's cute. And they will decay together in beautiful harmony. It's cute. By the way, what the hell? You guys! I told you! How long were they doing that back there? I don't know. I'll have to watch the camera. They like to move on us, so pay attention, I guess. Not sneaky devils. Oh, now my guy's doing the splits. Hello. Hello. Bye. 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 B. Good. So we've talked about mummification as far back as the ancient Egyptians. Self mummification. Modern day mummification. Mm hmm. Bog bodies. Mm, natural mummification from the earth, yes. And modern day embalming. So many ways that people have tried to preserve bodies for the afterlife. I think there's so many more ways to come. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. I wish aquamation was a thing for humans in our mm. state. So it's a more environmentally friendly way of cremation, but instead of using fire and a lot of power, including the air, mm -hmm. they put you in a bag with a little bit of water and put in a little chamber that puts a lot of heat and a lot of pressure and then it basically turns you into mush and then they dry you out and use the mm. cremulator to grind up your bones and then it looks exactly like regular cremains except you were cremated with water instead of fire mm. you can do that for your pets here in our state but it is not yet allowed for human bodies that's weird why not is it too expensive again or is it just like not allowed it's just not just state it's just not allowed yet yeah they just want you to spend that money and um, burn you alive and pollute the air and conspiracy theories <laughs> on our next episode just kidding <laughs> Everybody and everything dies. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. We can't fight it. No such thing as immortality, guys. I am so sorry to burst your bubble, but it's, as my dad always used to say, as you're living, you might not be able to keep appointments, but the one appointment you will always keep is with death. He's got you on a timer. You just don't know when you have to show up. Oh, you'll never know when your appointment is. Mm -mm. But he does. She does, depending on who death is to you. So on that note, thank you for joining us today. We are the Black Dahlia Twins. I'm Quinn. I'm Shelby. And we thank you. And please like, subscribe, hit that bell so that you are notified of any future uh, episodes we will have. And we'll try and keep you guys updated. Thank you so much. And also to add, comment below. Give us some ideas. Give us new topics because it's just the two of us we need some help guys we need your input on what you want to see what you want us to talk about if you give us a good enough topic we might give you a shout out possibly we need, we're still thinking about it we need the juicy details we need the juice we need to marinate in it and also possibly in the future if you have a good enough story we might even have you on the podcast. Mm -hmm. We can also do FaceTime. We can connect that. So um, no matter where you're at, we can still do interviews. And hit that bell so you are notified for all notifications. Mm -hmm. So that way YouTube doesn't try to mess up the algorithm and only show you something that you might want to see. If you want to be notified every time we post a video, adjust your notifications, guys. <laughs> 
do it for us because we love you. Do it, do it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Dum, dum, dum. No, I nope, still don't again. like a dying out nope, horse. Nope, try it again. Look at that side. <laughs> really like a dying seal. <laughs> if that's like what like one of those um, dinosaurs sounded like, what are those? Triceratops? At least I didn't actually I thought you were sucking my soul like a Dementor. No. <laughs>